Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Clara Burks, and I'm joined by my colleague, Jim Patterson. Today, we'll be discussing the topic of transforming PMO success with AI, discovering one plan's strategic portfolio and work management platform. If you enjoy the topic, please explore our channel for more and keep an eye out for new webinars coming soon. I hope you gain some insights from this webinar and feel excited about the new developments happening in the industry and here at OnePlan. Thank you again, and I'll now turn the presentation over to Jim. There's no organization that's being impacted more than the PMO with uh, AI on a lot of fronts. And they're also being impacted by the move towards a need for more strategic portfolio management. And we're going to talk about those aspects and how they have, uh, affect the PMO today. Uh, definitely modern challenges and transformations that are going on. Uh, as we speak. So today's PMOs are facing challenges on multiple fronts. In this modern competitive age, we move to digital uh, digitalization uh, as we do digital transformation and other business transformations that uh, result from that. Uh, PMOs are having to adjust and move with that and move with it effectively to help us achieve more value in our organizations. Digital business leaders face these top challenges which uh, are directly uh, uh, aligned with uh, the role of the PMO, uh, helping orchestrate enterprise change. As these modern changes come by, they impact all parts of the organization and we all have to be pulling in the same direction. We get a lot more demand for doing things that maybe we have never done before and being able to prioritize and execute on these cross-functional investments that go across participation across all different functional areas of our company is um, more complex to coordinate and also speed to deliver value. In this modern age, the pressure is there, the market pressures, the competitive pressures to deliver faster than ever before, and not just deliver for the sake of delivering, but deliver things that, um, that actually bring genuine, genuine value to the table. Now, because of all this wide-ranging, cross-functional, and organization-wide type of changes that have to happen, Many organizations, and there is a trend to move from the more departmental PMOs to EPMOs. Uh, not that all are doing that, but because of the breadth and the, the width of the things that go across the organization and the depth, um, uh, this seems to be a move that's meeting the needs. The Gardner Group just did a study not too long ago and indicated that already 49% of organizations have an EPMO function uh, in their organizations, and that number is anticipated to grow. But why the shift? Well, it's really to address threats and opportunities, and because digital business leaders are constantly faced with a continuous flux of threats and opportunities with significant business implementations, whether they're digital or not. And responding to these threats and opportunities that have organization-wide impact correspondingly have a significant amount of effort and cost associated them with them that we have to invest in and basically manage and get value from. It then requires orchestration and governance at scale, not just departmentally, but across the entire organization, both of which are provided by an effective enterprise um, project or program management organization. Now, core EPML functions as, such as the execution of large enterprise-wide initiatives and quick effective portfolio prioritization to, to choose what we want are two of the most coveted capabilities, as we said earlier on in the prior slide, for digital business success, and the EPMO helps us achieve that vision. And also, it helps us establish better and the right relationships uh, within our organizations and a core focus on, on achieving the key business objectives of the overall company, the outcomes that we're seeking, and positioning in the appropriate place in the enterprise, the EPMO, with the right connections and the right relationships can significantly improve the enterprise's ability to do the things that we're talking about and deliver the value that's sought. So to do that, you know, it's more than just what we've done in the past years. Um, you know, having visibility to all our projects and programs and looking at status and being able to manage and provide governance around all that is great, but we really need to move to where we're all aligning well with strategy. That strategy uh, really is the, let's just say, the North Star of where we want to go with the organization, where our leadership wants to take us, where their vision is. And then what we execute on needs to be aligned with that. Otherwise, why are we doing it? If it's not helping us get to our overall strategy and where we want to go with the organization, we have to question 
why is it why are we even even consider uh, considering doing that and if we align with strategy well and then we execute well on the things that we choose to do that align with that we should achieve success and deliver value so the Gardner Group looks at it as a set of processes involving the people, the strategy itself, and the operations that support it, and also as an overall system of strategy development by your leadership, then planning around that, and then organizational alignment on how to get there, and having operational plans and other types of plans to get there, and then monitor and learn from that, and adapt as we go forward by executing these strategies and getting better and better at it as we go over time. And this is Gartner's uh, uh, view of the world. So strategic portfolio management is, if we define that as a set of business capabilities and processes and people around that, there are more dimensions to it than just our projects and our portfolios and our resources, for example. If we look over at the different elements or objects that we see over on the right-hand side, we have objectives or strategies, we have tangible key results, we then have things like projects traditionally. We have epics, which might indicate more agile efforts. We might have features and detailed things within uh, those uh, agile or software development efforts or product development efforts. And we might be uh, having value streams and continuous delivery of products, et cetera, and delivering business capabilities along the way. And these things need to be aligned if we're gonna achieve the objectives because they all contribute, are associated, or have to at least be factored in in order to achieve success. So leadership requires strategic portfolio management to support this enterprise-wide strategy to execution alignment and be able to adapt to it. And defining of these key business strategies and business outcomes has to factor in more than just the projects and the resources and such. There are business capabilities that may have to be addressed or modernized, for example. Um, there might be digital and physical products that we need to um, uh, address, modernize, modify. The applications in our systems internally might have to be addressed or factored in. Can they support where we want to go or do they need to be redone or do they need to be uh, modernized? And the projects themselves that have to be aligned. So once again, multidimensional, more things being factored in uh, than we may have factored in in the past. And then we have to define and prioritize the strategies, manage the execution of the initiatives that align that align and drive the achievement of those strategies, and then have full, full visibility and consideration of the core functional assets that need to be involved. And so we have the leadership who sets that direction overall, we have IT or functional management who owns the assets and the infrastructure within the organization, and then the execution teams that actually have to deliver on this stuff, who actually have to uh, create and, 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 and execute on the projects, et cetera. So the importance here is really about the fact that we are in the midst of ever increasing complexity in business environments. And as we do that, change happens often, we have to manage risk, we have to optimize the portfolios, and we have to align them. And this is a continuous effort. It's not something that we just do as an annual exercise. There's a greater need for financial and resource optimization because we only have so many resources. We, most of us have resource constraints and, and uh, it's a constraint that we have to deal with. And we have to make sure that we're prioritizing the right things and then allocating the resources that we have to maximize the value that we're delivering. And then we have a demand for data-driven decision-making. If things are changing, we wanna know if we're making the right choices, we need to have data at our fingertips and have data that has a lot of different dimensions to it and provide insight and not only into the performance of the portfolio, but also making informed form decisions on what it is we're gonna work on, what we're gonna select next, what those strategic goals might be or what they need to be as they change. And then the adoption of agile and other project management methodologies means that there's a variety of ways that people are doing work. It's not just a one size fits all proposition. And to get that all folded into a central effective portfolio management capability and process, you need a system that will allow you to get there. And project portfolios aligning with strategic goals is something that needs to be visible. And then emerging technologies and business, business models with this digital transformation age that we're in, the way we do business in the past is probably not the way we're going to do business and reach our customers and interact with our customers in the future. And part of this is that we have to get more effective internally with our operations. We also might have new business models in the way we address, uh, get awareness, uh, interact, sell our products or services to our customers. And we have to emerge these. And these may be changing over time, not only if we are innovative and are the leader in, in a certain idea and a way to do that, 
but maybe even just to keep up with our competition and where the market's going so that we don't get left behind. So add to that the recent rise of AI and the rapid adoption and evolution of that. Uh, since ChatGPT was made public in November 2022, that's all, not all that long ago, it has reached well over 180 million users. It is by far um, the quickest time to reach a million users of any technology in recent in recent memory or in recent recent times or anything that we can uh, fathom. And if you look at that, we then have to say it's here, it's real. What are we going to do about it? Now, many organizations are coming to that realization. And um, in 2023, organizations, 45% uh, of organizations have increased their investment in AI and AI technology and what they're going to do with that. Another 46 have had no change at this point, but I think you're going to rapidly see that change in the coming months. Now, it's a hot new technology with excitement, but also with apprehension, right, on how we're going to deal with that, how we're going to govern it. It's got ease of use for personal use and experimentation, so our employees are definitely, you know, fiddling with it, and they're using it in a variety of different ways because it's readily available. It has massive market implications. How are we going to turn this into business advantage? How are we going to turn this into a business opportunity? We all have to be thinking in that, in that regard uh, in our industries. And it offers significant potential opportunities there, but it also entails disruption and risk. And we have to manage that. We have to factor in what that's going to mean to us. So the current challenges we have as strategic portfolio leaders and PMOs is we got to cut through the generative AI hype okay, that, that we have there. There's a, there's a lot of hype, but there's a lot of meat to it too. And we must identify its business and functional implications fast. We don't want to be caught napping. We want to be able to adjust and, and take advantage of it in a way that makes sense for our business and not be left behind by our competitor. It's not a matter of if. Gen AI will impact your strategic portfolio management lifecycle in, in a lot of different ways. So I think we have to prepare now for key inbound Gen AI impacts to ensure strategic planning and execution and leveraging and maximizing its impact and benefits in the way we do business in our uh, PMO operations. So the key is it's not to necessarily change the fundamentals of what we do with strategic portfolio management, but incorporate Gen AI uh, into uh, those practices. For example, you know, adapting to portfolio market changes, not only Will AI help us in the analysis of that? But to be quite frank, we may get intake ideas and business proposals and business cases for different approaches to gener to use generative AI and use AI um, as projects that we want to pursue. And we have to sort through that and we have to determine what are the right things for us to work on. How what's best ways for our organization to leverage these things and what initiatives should we embark upon in order to take advantage of that. Building next generation talent. This is new. We have to make sure that our people and our PMOs and that are working in strategic portfolio management uh, learn how to work with and maximize the benefit of these technologies so that we can achieve the benefit and, uh, and, and get the gains that are promised and, 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 and stay ahead of the game. And then we have to embrace these disruptive technologies, meaning we can't just put our head in the sand and say, uh, well, you know, we're not ready for this. Um, it's it's all it's all too new. Uh, we need to embrace it, but we need to figure out the ways that we can incorporate it, maximize it, leverage it, and take full advantage uh, uh, of the potential that's there with uh, AI capability. So when we, think th we talk about AI and portfolio management, some of the things that we can look at in areas that it can help us today is augmented data entry you know, create relevant information and details, narrative, the types of things that we want. It can definitely reduce the time and effort required to, to do that manual entry. Automated information retrieval, you know, analyze the data, right? Uh, be able to give us information and suggestions. Uh, be able to reduce the time and effort required for analysis and synthesis of complex data models. Uh, communication automation, automate communication uh, narrative and text to stakeholders, reducing the need for manual communication and building that from scratch. Yeah, resource estimation, estimate the resources required for a project based upon historical knowledge and reducing the risk for over and under staffing, you know, optimize that process. And then 
identify underperforming investments, you know, scrutinize project related information, how things are performing, and give us some suggestions on what we should address, what requires our attention, whether we should, you know, con, uh, put further funding against those, or should we terminate or put something on hold? Forecast on completion, uh, forecast completion and spending. Identify recurring patterns and trends and figure out ways that we can get better at that. Budget and plan optimization. Yeah. Analyzing your project data, identify areas where that you can, your budget can be optimized. And then uh, uh, figure out where that resource allocation or process improvement can help achieve that. And complement your decision-making. Um, you know, the best case for generative AI is to complement uh, our human intellect and our human efforts and our own insights, but also be able to bring things to the table that we might not fully be able to comprehend with our own human intellect, uh, and with the, which the AI possibly can. And then risk identification, be able to identify potential risks before we might see them or notice them and mitigate them before they, while, we, while we still have an opportunity to have some effect on that. Uh, defect reduction by scrutinizing project data to pinpoint areas where defects are most likely to transpire and keep get our antennas up. And then data anomalies. Understand where things don't make sense, right? Where outliers are. That it, it, do they indicate errors or do they indicate something that's a, that's a problem that we need to address? So just some areas or suggestions that a PMO can look at look at in portfolio management. Now, you know, we represent one plan solutions and one plan does provide a path to strategic portfolio management and a complete solution for the enterprise. It does give us those strategic planning capabilities for the business leaders, the ability to develop OKRs, objectives and key results, be able to identify the value streams or the key streams of value that we're going to be delivering as an organization, both internally and externally. The execution leaders, now that's our PMOs and the project managers and the scrum masters and the product owners that we have out there that are going to execute on the things that are going to help deliver on that strategy. Uh, we have tools in there to help, whether you be a more adaptive approach with multi-methodologies and multi-tools, whether you're a professional services organization, whether it's an agile approach across the board, or even product development. And then the functional leaders, the ones we talked about that own the core assets, you know, be able to identify enterprise architecture elements, uh, application portfolio elements, product portfolio elements, and factor those in and align them with the other two, with the strategies and with the execution elements that we have in our solution. As we evolve, not everybody's going to be fully matured into a full strategic portfolio or SPM type of process. One plan gives the opportunity to meet where you're at in a crawl, walk, run approach. Leverage the things that you can today, but have a solution with the capability that will allow you to grow into the other elements of a full SPM methodology and solution and system and process at a time when you're ready. And you can set your uh, roadmap to, to help achieve that if, if that's where you want to go. Just to give you a quick idea of the types of capabilities that one plan provides in the mix is an overall strategic plan on the upfront part, because you got to have a strategy. And then hopefully the intake, the ideas and the requests that come in are ones that align with and help support the achievement of those strategies. And then there's the enterprise architecture elements that we talked about, whether they be applications, business capabilities, whether they be products or, or value streams. The idea is to have those identified and understand and factor those in where they are required in order to succeed on the projects and or the strategies themselves. And a full selection process whereby we can choose from the myriad of ideas and requests that come in what initiatives, projects, uh, efforts that we're going to invest in and tackle. Full portfolio planning, whether it be traditional list views or more agile approaches with portfolio boards, with uh, roadmaps, uh, et cetera, be able to view those things. Be able to have full resource capacity planning. So as we assess what it is we're gonna do and what it's gonna take, we can look and see what do we have the capacity to tackle? Um, what can we do with the resources that we have or identify where we would need additional research to achieve the things we want to do. And the same thing holds true with finances, be able to have detailed financial planning and tracking and understand our constraints there in our selection of what we want to tackle. And a full what if scenario modeling capability to look at alternatives, to be able to evaluate and assess viable alternatives uh, before we actually implement them without impacting the current production data in our portfolios. Now the execution side of that, you know, we have to execute on anything we select to do, and whether it be more waterfall work plans, 
more agile work plans with backlogs and sprints. One plan has those capabilities built right into the solution, but we have a connector technology that's inherent to one plan that allows us to connect to popular work management tools or scheduling tools that you might be using today. You know, Microsoft Projects, Smartsheet, you know, Project for the Web, Azure DevOps, Jira, et cetera. The idea is if you have things in place, we can fold that in and roll it into the central portfolio for you. And even track things like issues, risks, change requests, et cetera. And then the resource planning on an individual project by project basis that rolls into that capacity plan, those are all inherent in the solution, as well as that team members that have to participate in your projects. You can get status from them real time as they enter directly into the system across all the things that they're working on. They don't have to go to different tools or spreadsheets to do that. And if you need to record time, you know, whether it be for capitalization of labor, whether it be for chargebacks internally, whether it be for billing the clients, that is just a native part of the system that allows you to do that without having to do something externally with a third party system. And all the reporting, you know, onboard status reporting, dashboards at all levels, you know, the portfolio, the programs, the projects, the resources, et cetera. And then visualization is really powerful. When I talk about all those interrelated things in that enterprise architecture and our strategic alignment and our projects, how do those things interrelate with one another and how do they uh, impact one another is something that you want to see visually. Ultimately, this helps us deliver what we need to deliver uh, at the end of the day and deliver value. The artificial intelligence part that we were talking about, one plan has um, developed its own AI assistant, Sophia GPT, and we'll talk about that. And it's available to us all the time within one plan in all aspects of the product. So ultimately, we want to provide you with tools that help you select the right work to do, right? And then to execute well and do the work right. Now, today we're talking about the PMO and the project management office of the EPMO definitely is a primary place to get value from what we're talking about here today. But in an enterprise PMO, you're gonna to touch all these other different parts of the organization. So whether you're managing these things departmentally today, there's tools in here and these concepts do apply to you uh, um, if you're looking to get better and improve uh, in these dimensions and delivering the projects and working on the right things. So Sophia GPT is the AI assistant in one plan. And it is a purpose built for strategic portfolio management AI assistant that will help us with all the different areas that we talked about as far as the potential areas that AI can help us with in, in, in portfolio management and in our PMOs. Now it's always available in one plan. So if you're in one plan and you want to ask Sophia a question, give Sophia a prompt in an area, it will not only look at the vast amounts of data that has, it has learned in its Azure OpenAI, and we're built in the Microsoft cloud of Azure OpenAI with all the security and permissions and compliance that's built around that, but it will also analyze the data that you have available to you in one plan to apply its knowledge against the data sets that you've put in here, giving you a purpose-built, relevant AI capabilities for the PPM or SPM uh, uh, purpose that you have. So right now, if you look at where it says now in the, on the fourth box there, we now have generative AI, inbuilt AI assistance, but be assured that this promise of future autonomous-based AI that'll do things automatically for you, uh, we're already in development and planning for those things, that it's going to be, that future is gonna be here sooner rather than later, and one plan is gonna be the platform that's gonna deliver that for you. So some sample use cases in one plan that people use today. Strategic planning, is where AI can be applied, portfolio optimization in one plan, work management, helping build plans and resource plans, assessing risk, uh, helping with resource allocation, and even looking at financials and investment forecasting. Those are some areas that are there today, and we're constantly adding to the use cases that one plan can support you with, with Sophia GPT. With that, I thought I'd go to a demonstration of one plan and give you a, a high-level overview of what's in there. Um, you know, from a strategic portfolio management perspective, there's all kinds of dimensions and tools that you might want to get into, and they're all available to you here in the in the left side navigation, like it is in most modern tools. And there's a home page available for all users, and depending on your role, you'd see different things depending on who you are and what your what your role is in the organization. But insights onto things that require your attention, quick access to the plans that you are personally involved in, without having to go to a larger 
uh, expansive portfolio to find the things that pertain to you. Conversations on tasks and resources and plans that might be in there, things that might be due that need to re require your attention. Once again, quick access to the things that pertain to you uh, the most. Now we've talked about the, everything has to start with a strategy. And in one plan, there is a strategic planning area uh, called My Strategy. In this case, it's modeled in objectives and key results. And to be quite honest, you can model it whatever framework you like, but by default, and what people seem to be doing today is managing objectives and key results where the objective or the strategy that they're trying to achieve is outlined, and then some tangible key results to help measure whether or not we're actually making progress towards that goal to achieving that, right? And being able to go in there and look at um, a strategy like increased project success rate and be able to drill into something like that and set the parameters for that, set a time frame for when you'd like to do that, set the key results that are associated with that, even set prioritization for this objective or this strategy as we start looking at trade-offs around those types of things. Now, is this aligned uh, with uh, a, a variety of other things? Absolutely, the visualizer that we talked about, and we're gonna get to these elements in another uh, further in this demonstration, but we can look and see if there's any overall predecessors and successors to what it is we're working with. But from an alignment perspective, we can come in here very quickly and say, this objective has three key results. These key results are, have projects and epics that are being executed on to support the achievement of those. And by the way, we're also related or dependent upon certain products, certain applications, et cetera, and, and even business capabilities and value streams. And you could be as expansive in this as you would like to be, or as narrow as you would like to be in this. And from the visualizer here, you know, you can go in here and you could, um, you know, basically come into any one of these elements and get a quick view of, you know, the status, the details around this, and why it is where we're at on the status of that effort, or you could drill right into that element. If something's red, we could actually drill into that and look into the reasons as to why it's red and, and, and keep our finger on the pulse of the things that we're related to as we go on through. So once again, the strategy is very key in here, the objectives and the key results. Now, if we go to the next thing we talked about, which is kind of ideas and requests and the things that we are going to embark upon, to be able to have a central portal for anybody in your organization to be able to come in and submit an idea or a request into the mix, and then also be able to potentially do crowdsourcing and have people say vote on these things, uh, it may be in parallel with what's being uh, going through your internal approval process and that type of thing, right? And as we go through something like this and we drill into something like this website redesign, right? We have a details page where we can capture all the relevant information. We have an approval or process or approval workflow. We might even put business case narratives in here. We might put in financial elements. We might put in prioritization mechanisms, whether they be business drivers that uh, how well they relate drive maybe a calculated score or if an agile approach, maybe a weighted shortest job first methodology. And then even looking at the things that it may be, result, uh, may, may be related to in here, we're seeing that they're related to an actual key result in the strategic plan. So once again, that type of um, uh, relation is, is key here and be able to look at those associations as we go through the next phase on that, putting in ideas and requests that help align with our strategy. If I go into, say, a prioritization view uh, in my ideas and let's introduce Sophia uh, into the mix here. Um, if I go in and I want to ask Sophia a question. Um, let me ask Sophia, what three projects, what based on priority and ROI, what three projects should we approve first and why out of these ideas? And see what Sophia has. Now we've got all kinds of information, financial, business case information, business drivers, et cetera. And as it considers this, it's going to um, uh, give us some semblance of an answer and some analysis as to uh, what it is we should pick and why. So it tells me here the cybersecurity audit is number one and gives us the budget, the benefits, the prioritization score, the ROI, and it has the highest prioritization making it essential to the company's data against potential threats. So it's not only the subject matter, but where it fits with the numerics, voice uh, assistant integration, et cetera. It's crucial to enhancing the company's product offerings, et cetera. The idea is we're getting those types of suggestions to help us 
and guide us as we have a myriad of things to choose from. So once again, selection of ideas and requests. Now, ultimately, you can take these things and you can promote any of these into a portfolio item or a project at any given point in time. And by doing so, you would have an active portfolio, not just a funnel of ideas and requests that you can then work upon. Now in this, this portfolio could be designed for an EPMO or a departmental PMO. In this particular case, I've got multiple portfolios that are for different parts of the organization, for business transformation, operational excellence, the professional services part of the organization, the product innovation organization, the data analytics group. So for example, you could model this in an enterprise fashion or for a single entity within your organization. And if I look at this, for example, and I open up uh, this, you'll notice that there's a hierarchy here in place. And you can develop your own, what we'd call primary plan type hierarchy. In this case, I've got a traditional portfolios with programs within the portfolios, and then I've got projects and epics that could be within the program, which could be you know, indicating more waterfallish types of projects versus maybe more agile type of efforts that we're working on. And in that regard, we can have all those in there and the details around that we're working on. Now we've got views in here that show KPIs and budget and benefits and costs, but the data and the fields you show, you could have different views with different columns of data appearing within that. Also, I'd like to call your attention to the icons on the left-hand side here. We talked about integration with other tools. Notice that here I've got um, um, Microsoft Planner, Azure DevOps, I've got Jira, I've got Project for the Web from Microsoft. I got Project Professional from Microsoft. Um, I even have some that only have a Teams icon, meaning it's connected to a Teams site for content and collaboration in Teams, but it doesn't have a scheduling tool associated with it, meaning that they're managing maybe the schedule and the work items directly here within one plan, meaning that everything comes together into one portfolio, regardless of the source of the tool that's being worked with at the detailed level, right? Now, um, in this, yes, I've got a primary hierarchy, but you may want to look at it in different flavors. So, for example, if I go in here and I um, um, go into a view that, say, is more of a flat view, let me strip out the hierarchy and just look at a list of projects and epics. I can take any of the data or metadata, and you can add as many custom fields as you want in here. There's a bunch of them in here that are provided by one plan, but I could look into this and I could say, all right, I don't want to look at this by portfolio and program. Let me look at this by business unit and summarize this and say, all right, how much of this is in our capital planning group and be able to look at the projects that are within capital planning. And very quickly, I could just say, let me look at this uh, uh, portfolio, um, maybe by, oh, I don't know, manager. And if I look at it by manager, I can come, come in here and I could say, uh, Austin's got six projects going on all at once what's going on with those and be able to drill into those on an individual basis, right? Um, you know, I could do the same thing by the way, I, any other way I categorize projects. And here we've got a field called category. In this case, I could say, hey, here's all the compliance projects that we're working on, et cetera. And it, you're basically only limited by your imagination on all that, right? Now, if I go into um, the board allows us to use more agile types of approaches where I may be able to drag backlog items into different stages within here, right? Um, I might be able to go in here and say in the proposed state, I've, I've already got market research is already in the red, you know, and I might want to say, um, you know, why is that red? I can go in here and look at any given point in time, you know, the details around that, even though it's just a card with a few data elements on it, I can look at all the data and see what's going on with this particular element at any given point in time or drill into it fully. I could also, like we talked about with the visualizer before, I could come into this and I could say, you know, let me visualize the things that are in here so that I can come in here and, 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 and look at how these things are related to one another as I go through that. So if I come through here and I go into the reporting and I say, let's visualize, I can see that market research has predecessors and successors, things that it's dependent upon and things that are depending on it. And that runway view that we talked about earlier on, we can see that market research is red and it's putting at risk because of its redness, the delivery of certain key results and hence certain objectives within that and other things that are related to it. We also have roadmap views um, in, our, um, in our portfolios. And as we go in here, we can look at these roadmaps 
and you can fashion your own roadmap views in here uh, however you'd like to look at it. Like right here, I've got a roadmap by business unit and it's got the swim lanes by business unit. It's got the key uh, events that we're trying to uh, work towards, but you can set your own you know, views in here as you see fit. You know, I could come in here and just say, uh, let, let me see it by, uh, by goal, say, instead of by business unit. In this case, customer satisfaction, grow the business, et cetera. And at any given point in time, you could drill into that data regarding these things, just like we did in the other view. If I go to a portfolio summary view, say, and more of a list view that has a lot of data elements associated with it, and let's say I expand this out and look at all the details of all the projects and things that are in there. And I wanna ask Sophia a question in the portfolio. And I could say, um, as we're executing on these, what I'd like to know is uh, what three projects are at high risk of failure and why? And it's a fairly broad question, but you know, perhaps we'd like to understand what that is. And maybe we want to be considering this because we've got some ideas coming in that we want to make room for. Maybe we want to uh, reallocate resources and see maybe we should suspend operations on a certain project. It's telling us that market research uh, is listed as off track and that it has it's off track on multiple dimensions. Uh, brand management is off track for both plant type and it's actually has multiple things that'll put at risk by not succeeding. The idea there is you're going to get the information as uh, as to why you might potentially uh, suspend or quit on certain projects in lieu of other ones based upon the answers you're getting from Sophia. Now, I would just say as you drill into specific uh, projects in here, you know, we've been looking at things all from a portfolio sense. If I drill into a one particular project or plan within here, you'll see that we have a bunch of data associated in what we call our details page. You can have your project life cycle or your phases in here, your gates, the, the data elements and the, and the metadata that you would wanna categorize and classify your projects by, maybe bringing forth the business case data that came from, uh, forward from the, uh, uh, um, the ideas area, your prioritization mechanism and prioritization score, your enterprise architecture on what elements, here it's related to a bunch of key results, it's related to a bunch of applications. It's related to several products, and it's related to a value stream within our organization. But once again, these forms are configurable, so it would capture the data or display the data that you're interested in. But the key things here is you have work plans, and those work plans can either be, you know, more waterfallish type of plans uh, or backlogs here, like you see uh, with sprint plans, or they could be waterfall schedules. You can track issues and risks and changes, document key decisions. And the key part here is that you can connect these to other tools. Like in this particular case, it's independent and being done right in one plan, but it could just as easily have been connected to Azure DevOps, Jira, or some other planning tool in the mix. Since it was a backlog item, it was connecting me to more agile tools. Our schedule work type is designed to connect you with maybe more waterfall type scheduling things like Smartsheet or Project Planner, et cetera. The idea there is, is that you can connect to these other tools like we mentioned earlier on. And then any one of these projects has a resource plan available to it so that you can plan in terms of hours, FTEs, percentages, schedules, et cetera, and understand at any given point in time if the resources that you have are over or under allocated in relation to all the other things that they're working on within the organization. And the same thing holds true with your financial plan, where you can have detailed financial plans and tracking within this solution to help uh, drive those uh, uh, financial considerations and constraints that you have to deal with. The resource plan, et cetera, that's gonna get us to an overall resource capacity plan that we talked about. So for example, I showed you, just showed your resource plan within an individual plan or an individual project. Here I'm looking at a resource plan that's, for example, you know, a roll up of all the things that, for example, uh, our developers are working on. And here I've got uh, a developer here, um, and I got Ehrlich Bachman, and I can see that he is um, over allocated. And if I want to look at this instead of hours, let me just look at it in terms of full time equivalents. And I can see he is two times allocated within this period of time. And I have to offload things from him. So in this particular case, you know, I need to be able to come in here and say, you know, maybe I need to get him off something in here in this time frame. 
know, maybe I need to get him off of, see if we can get him off of the market research project. And by doing that, we can maybe look at candidates and find matches for Ehrlich that might be helpful. And for example, in here, in this time frame, I see that potentially Toby Stevens has some bandwidth in the green here in these time frames where I'm going to need him from that for that for that project, and I could potentially select Toby and replace Ehrlich up above and do those resource trade-offs right in here as I go on through. So once again, we have a lot of information here that we can uh, work with and help us reconcile and uh, normalize our resource plans across all this. So let me just go into say a some resource summary view that has all of our resources in there. Let's say I want to ask Sophia, what resources do I need to hire? It's telling me that you first need to assess the current workload, et cetera. So it's giving me the things I need to consider. And it says, based on the table data provided, it says that um, I'm short on the business analyst side of things and overage in certain months during the year. I need to hire additional business analysts to help, et cetera. Now, a follow-on question, what's nice about this is you can layer on these types of questions against all of this, right? And after it gives me the types of uh, information I'm looking at and who might be um, over allocating the things that we might need, I might ask another question at the end of that. And the other follow-on question might be, you know, how many of each resource am I gonna need, right? And I maybe help me to quantify this uh, as I go on through. So it's being pretty elaborate in what it's giving me as far as suggestions here, as far as the resource plan that I have in place, given the capacity that I have. Now let me see if I say uh, how many of each resource. And, and, and Sophia and AI capabilities are only going to get better as we go over time. I mean, it's amazing what the what kind of information we're getting. Um, you know, when we were in the work plan with the schedules, et cetera, you can actually give it a uh, a, a name of a project or a subject matter of a project and ask it to build a work breakdown structure for you. And it will actually build a suggested work breakdown structure for you, uh, which you can then modify. Here is basically in the details, basically it's given me the average hours that are needed in here. And considering the both existing analysts in here, I'm gonna need one to two additional. It's given me pretty detailed analysis in here. So without elaborating that further, spending too much time in there, just wanna let you know the resource management aspect can definitely be addressed with, uh, with Sophia. Now, we do have a what-if modeler, as we talked about in the presentation earlier on. And in that what-if modeler, we can actually do scenarios. And you can actually build models where you have different categories or types of projects pulled into a model saying, these are the things we would like to potentially do. And there's 40 elements in here right now, right? And for example, if I wanted to do all of this, and I look at all the financial planning data, I could see in here that um, uh, that financial plan, it would take me $20 million to do all of it. Right. If I look at it from a resource perspective, I can come in here and I can say what it's going to take and I can look and see, you know, I've got a lot of red and over allocations in here. I do not have the resourcing to handle all of this, to do all of this, as you see it right here. And this is where you'd come in in this model and you can actually create different scenarios off of this model. For example, I created a $10 million scenario saying if I needed to get down to $10 million and I selected projects down to that $10 million level. These are the ones that are in. These are the ones that are out, right? And if I come down and I look at the financials around that, I can see that indeed it does get me under the $10 million threshold that I was looking at. If I look at it from a resource dimension, I can also see that uh, almost all the red is gone and even the ones that I have are not severely over allocated uh, in, in any way, shape, or form across like it was prior. So the idea is, okay, not a bad looking um, alternative. And then I could do the same thing with a $15 million scenario and see how I can make with that. I could also interject, for example, instead of just selection or deselection, I can add a Gantt chart view of this at any given point in time. And for example, I could take a proposed project and say, well, what if I move it out to a, a, a time frame uh, out in the future and allow it to do that and let it recalculate um, the financials around all that and basically look at what that would do to it. And you know, as I look at something like this and I come down here, it actually would take um, not some out of the total value, but it takes out of what's in the current 12 month period and it took it out and put it out into the next fiscal year. So once again, I can save these scenarios as I go through, I can compare them. So I can look at the $10 million and $15 million scenario and I can see readily in here that 
if I get another $5 million of investment, I can target maybe another $20 million in benefit. It might be worth my while to go see if I can secure that $5 million in funding. And also look at the different things in here, like the details around each of these scenarios. I can look at, you know, comparing the two and basically seeing what's in, what's out in each of the scenarios, what the priority is in each of those scenarios as they go relative to one another. I can also look at not only the financial impacts of that, but I can look at your traditional um, bubble charts, I should say. Let me look at the traditional bubble charts whereby uh, I can pivot that data and I can actually do a traditional bubble chart of seeing what's been selected. And in this case, I'm looking at priority versus benefits. And I can see I've got things that are higher priority, um, varying scale of benefits. And I can also see the things I didn't select and maybe to do a double check to make sure that I didn't overlook something that I should have selected. And then once again, that visualizer capability is used in another context here. I can come in here and look at this and say, here are the things we did select, but here are unselected predecessors and successors. Are these things that are going to be critical for me to do? And should I reconsider whether or not I include them in lieu of something else? The runway and how these things are all interrelated, like we showed you before, once again, that's all here as the objectives and the key results and the plans and the products and applications, et cetera. And we can see how all these things are interrelated through our selection process. So once again, a holistic view of all those elements as we go on through. I would just say briefly, we talked about the enterprise architecture elements, and I know we're running short on time, um, is how we got to that is you can create portfolios of different other enterprise or business architecture elements within the solution. Here in a comprehensive view, I've got a portfolio of products. I got a portfolio of business capabilities. I got a portfolio of applications. I got a portfolio of value streams and of organizational elements. And as I go through and look at any one of these, our plan types don't have to carry the same type of data. I went into a detail page on a project and it had a bunch of different details on it for projects or plans and epics. Well, here I've got the life cycle of a, of a product and I've got a project uh, product vision map. I've got a uh, canvas. I've got prioritization. I've got timelines. I've got financials. I've got upgrades. I've got relation, things related to, to this particular product. So the idea here is, is we can have the data we want for any one of these elements. And once again, these can all be related to a number of different things. So for example, I can look at the visualizer from this vantage point, meaning from a product centric view, if I went to visualize how this is related to things, there are a couple of products that are precedence related to Bachmanity. And I can also look at Bachmanity and see it is supporting four key results, hence four objectives. And it also has other projects and epics and business capabilities that it's related to as well. So I can see the totality of how this stuff is all interwoven. So once again, uh, anywhere in the system, you can get that capability. So let's go back and just talk about a few more things. You know, we talked about using AI with strategic planning earlier on as we as we were doing that. And for example, we could analyze and uh, data to identify patterns, opportunities, and potential risks within our strategic plan. So for example, if I just ran this, and this is a one that we pre-recorded, I can ask it that question, ask it to identify this within our strategic plan, right? And basically, it'll tell me what the highest priority objectives should be, right? Um, uh, what opportunities that we have around those, right, et cetera. Once again, some analysis that we may not get ordinarily ourselves. You know, provide in the portfolio, provide a summary of portfolio data. And we can come in here and, you know, look at that and uh, have it just summarize for us um, the details around that and encapsulate it in a way that makes sense and tells us how we're doing on each of these particular projects and what the portfolio health looks like overall. And AI-enabled work management. This is one of those ones where we have augmented data entry, where you know we could actually do business case definition and have it write the narrative. We could actually do risk identification, where we can come in and say, identify potential risks and how to mitigate them within our particular project on this smart home automation system. Let me just run that one real quick. So right here, we're within, a, we're within a particular project. And we're going to identify potential risks, not one that we have here, but given the nature of the project and the kind of work it is, it's going to tell us that unauthorized access to personal data is a, is a risk, data breaches, cyber attacks, 
mitigation strategies are here, uh, interoperability, potential risks, et cetera, technical failure. So once again, it's giving us things to be alert on as we embark upon this particular project. Resource capacity planning. We can actually provide a sample resource plan. If we've got a plan in place and we've got a time frame in there, we can actually ask it to give us a sample resource plan. And in this case, we're gonna ask it to give us a, a sample resource plan for this shipping and delivery project. And here, amazingly, it's giving us by month, it's giving us the roles, it's giving us the uh, hours per month for role, and it's really got some great thought behind this. For example, it knows that we need um, uh, analyst work front-loaded into this project. It knows we need QA more back-loaded in this project, uh, et cetera. And, it's, and we can modify this as we go, but uh, we're gonna get to the point where it can automatically create this and put a plan in place right within the system for you. Um, financial insights, the same thing, right? Analyzing financial data. Help me write project summary emails to my manager, right? And so uh, this is where some of the big time saving can come from in writing um, uh, narratives. So for example, I've got a project, my manager wanted a quick summary, uh, ad hoc on how the project is going. Uh, and I can come in here and write here in email format. It's writing an email uh, for our current project summary on how things are going with the objectives, uh, progress, key metrics, et cetera. And once again, I could be done with this in a matter of seconds as opposed to agonizing over the uh, format and structure and the content of that for maybe a half an hour to an hour or more. Status report narrative, et cetera. So once again, hopefully we've given you a flavor for the kind of things that can be done with AI at this point. By no means was it exhaustive. So in summary, strategic portfolio management has become important to today's business environment and increasingly important for P, uh, PMOs and EPMOs. The increased complexity and fast pace of change requires us to enhance our methods and our approaches. Now, in the introduction of Gen AI, it's adding a degree of change impact to the PMO, not only in the way we do work, but also the types of projects we're going to have to consider because we're going to have to consider ones that are about adopting and leveraging Gen AI. So there's going to be a whole different genre of projects coming into the pipeline. One plan will provide end-to-end -end strategic portfolio management via the Microsoft Cloud. We hope we demonstrated that to you today. And one plan can meet you where you are. You don't have to use all the aspects of what we showed you here today to get the benefits, to attain benefits from the system. So hopefully you saw that in, in what, you had, um, what you looked at today. And the use of AI and Sophia will provide valuable assistance today, and it's only going to get better over time as we try to leverage these things in our day-to-day -day PMO effort. We do this full time. We're not a general systems integrator, software company. We focus on project and portfolio management. Uh, Microsoft has recognized us for five consecutive years, either as their global partner of the year or their finalist uh, in project and portfolio management globally. The Gartner Group has recognized us via the voice of the customer for our abilities in strategic portfolio management. So has Infotech Research and software reviews and other reputable uh, uh, analysts and review sites. We do webinars like this all the time. Uh, we have live webinars. We have another one coming up next week um, uh, that's designed to a similar topic, but focused on IT project delivery. But we also have a whole library of on-demand webinars that you can leverage uh, as we go through here. So feel free to reach out to them at, at, at oneplan.ai slash webinars and leverage anything that you think might be of value. You can do free trials and we have a strategic portfolio management template out there that I would strongly recommend that you use and you can use sample data that will help you get visualizations real quickly. Uh, we're happy to chaperone you on that if you like as well. So just reach out to us and let us know. So you can get a free trial. We're happy to do a roadmap workshop with you if you want some discussion on what it would take to get into this type of a technology. Or if you just want a more detailed demo, I gave you a kind of high level run through here today. Just reach out to us at contact at oneplan.ai or research this more at www.oneplan.ai. We're here to help and we really hope you'll engage with us. I'd like to thank you for dedicating this hour to us and uh, hopefully you got value from it today. Um, we think about one plan being the power of one, bringing everything into one hub, um, one pane of glass, one set of visibility. So once again, thanks again. Have a great day, everyone.